Welcome to this edition of Peak, Peak Performance, Performance Podcast. Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Welcome back to another episode of the Peak Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Thor Conklin, and today we have Tanya Lanthier. She is the founder and CEO of Dental Post, a dental industry's, the dental industry's largest online and mobile job board connecting and educating more than 750,000 job seekers and 50,000 dental offices in the United States and Canada. I'm on 60,000 now. Oh, 60,000 now? All right. 60,000. You got it. A dental, uh, a registered dental hygienist turned entrepreneur. Start in 2005 as a tool to help dental professionals connect and make smarter hires. Everybody needs smarter hires. And I want to get, get into that a little bit as well of how you use some metrics and some tools on the site in order to, uh, to help both the job seeker and uh, the dental offices as well. Uh, you've made the Inc. 5000 list three times. Congratulations. Four times. You've got to get your team to update your profile here. An amazing uh, woman, an amazing entrepreneur. Tanya, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I am, me. I am looking forward to this. Not, first of all, we're close friends. I've known you now for three or four years, if not longer. And I so respect you as an entrepreneur and as an individual as well. And I think it's so amazing that you were, you were a dental hygienist. You were raising two young girls you were trying to juggle everything and you just one day said, hey, I'm going to start my own company and you've built it into this mammoth organization. Bring us through the process of, of what clicked or what happened that finally said, no more, I'm going to do this. Well, you know, I think things are made out of a challenge. So um, I was uh, temping as a hygienist some and I needed more flexibility in my schedule because I was trying to get pregnant and I had a bout with infertility. So I ended up temping in over a hundred offices because I wanted to take care of my patients and I wanted to also take care of the doctors that I work for. And so I went to temping and I temped in over a hundred offices and that gave me a bird's eye view of seeing offices that were great to work for, offices that weren't great to work for, the ones that couldn't keep staff, the ones that kept staff. So I got to see the, the whole the cultural, cultural aspect of an office and the, the disconnect where they weren't finding each other. And um, I threw up a website um, and it, it's morphed into some, <laughs> this now, but um, I threw up a website just where people could go post a job, the doctors, because it was $500 to post an ad in the paper for 10 words for the weekend. And then I charged $54 and the doctors were like, this is great and in the Atlanta area. And um, there's, a dental com there's a dental society called the Hinman Dental Society, which throw the Hinman Co Dental Conference. It's the biggest one in the Southeast. Well, a lot of the guys I work for are on the board there. And um, they were like, you need to get a booth here. And I'm like, well, I can't afford a booth. And they're like, well, um, we're gonna turn our head. <laughs> We want you to get off flyers. <laughs> that was, you know, 16 years ago. That won't happen now. But uh, they were like, we're turning our heads. And for since then, I've just grew um, exponentially from city to city to city. But I didn't grow it fast for a while. It was kind of more of a hobby. And I had, you know, I had given birth to twins and then launched the company right after I gave birth. Um, and they were like nine months old. So I, I had my hands full. Unbelievable. You know, I, I love the fact that you said, hey, I wanted more flexibility. And you said, hey, let me start my own company. <laughs> For all the entrepreneurs out there listening, go, you know, we, we all thought that was the idea, right? We form our own company, we're our, our own boss, and all of a sudden everything is just easy, you know. But the reality is, that's when the hard, hard work starts. And you've got to just grind it. I love the fact that you said, you know, look, I started as a hobby. I started hustling. I started doing it. Started handing out flyers, and it just kept growing and growing. Because you're extremely competitive. Uh, you're a uh, aren't you like an Olympic gold medalist frisbee player? No, I like frisbee. But <laughs> well, you played a very competitive frisbee league. I know that. 
I, I, I used to. I play a little bit pickup now, but you know, I've gotten yeah. to the age where I'm kind of, kind of leaving. You're, you're, you're getting non-competitive now. <laughs> I'm not buying that for a moment. <laughs> I'm getting smarter that things hurt more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because your switch is like on or off, right? And when it's on, it's full bore. And that's the way you attack your business as well. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. It's, uh, I don't, I, it's, I think it's innate. I, but I do come from a background of entrepreneurs. So I was taught that you leave things better than you found them. You look to add value to people. You look to improve lives. My family were always improving people's lives in the, you know, in the, you know, the area they were raised. So. And that's really what it came down to. I, you know, we've had discussions uh, in the past where you said, you know, look, I saw what these dental hygienists, what it was like to find a great place to work. It was difficult for the doctors to find great um, uh, hygienists. And in addition to just as a, a job posting site and, and a place where you can find a job, you really go through the process of giving some tools in order to figure out what, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What, where's, where is there a good fit? Go through some of those tools that you offer. You know, um, I've been an EO for a while. You're an EO as well. Entrepreneur. Entrepreneur's organization. Yep. And, you know, I was a hygienist and trained as a hygienist. And going into these offices, I started to see the offices that worked really well with some of the tools they were, you know, giving to bring people in and then the development they were doing in the office that their revenue was really high because they put the development in their people. Um, and then I go into offices that just didn't give a care and it, you would see it in the, in the book. You would see the, the patients weren't showing up. You know, the book had lots of empty spots and I started to recognize these structural things that where offices would excel and people were happier. And then going you know, how I got into EO is what I was, I was cleaning people's teeth and I kept saying, I have this problem. I need to just develop this software and I need to find a lawyer that does this and blah, blah, blah. And every, I had a couple of EOers and they were like, you need to join EO. Well, I started to, I, I would see the, you know, the DISC personality test in the offices. And then, you know, you see EOers start to understand themselves as entrepreneurs and it, it you know, everything just clicked along the way. And then, um, you know, I had some difficult people in my life that I wanted to understand better and I wanted to understand myself. And I was always pulling the mirror up and looking at myself going, why do I, why do I feel that way about that person? What does that mean that they're acting that way? And so I really went into deep into the psychology of why people do what they do. And so I started adding these things like a disc personality test because it tells you how a person's going to communicate with you. Like I'm a, I'm an ID, DI kind of personality. So I'm driven with the D, my I's the cheerleader and I'm, you know, I'm going to sell and persuade. And then your S and your C are people, your, your S is your supportive person that, you know, will give you support. And your C is more your analytical person that gets the details down to the, you know, itty gritty. I'd rather pull my fingernails off and pour alcohol on them than do the details. So, and, you know, if you recognize that, then you can actually fill in the gap where people can help you succeed. Um, so in offices is that way. You can measure somebody on how they communicate with others and put them in the right fit for the right job. But there's not just personality that's part of the equation. The equation's big and people don't realize that. They're like, oh, I'm going to get a personality test and this person's going to fit better. But there's a lot of that equation. There's core values. And I, I, I come up with an assessment for that. Come up with an assessment for your work culture assessment has to do with what environment you're happy working in. Are you, do you like fast pace, slow pace, high technology, low technology? Do you, want, do you want a big office like a corporation to work for? Or do you want a small office like a boutique and where you'd be happier there? You know, there's a lot of little, you know, things about how you're made and what you like doing that, or if you're not even flexible to change. You know, there's a lot of to the equation that people try to, if you have all the data, you can make a better fit for your, your office, I believe. It sounds even, like- we, Even dating. That's what I was going to say. It sounds like we need to come up with a disc profile for marriages. Yeah. All right, fill out, this, fill out the application and uh, let's see where we uh, have a great fit. Because what you described is, is in any relationship, including a job. Yeah, it is. I love um, that. I believe that. All right, so we got our new business idea for the day. 
disc disc for marriages. Disc for marriages. Yeah, there should be it's so. But you go to that. That's so. There's a lot to that when it plays into the psychology of the female and the male. What each one wants, the different and the expectations. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot to that too. Right. I mean, you know, it, it's right. It's kind of funny because sometimes we want somebody like ourselves, and then all of a sudden we kind of look and go, wait a second. You know, they're way too much like me. I, I, I kind of like a little variety. I like somebody that's a little bit more analytical. I like somebody who's a little bit more supportive. Uh, but the opposite sometimes yeah. will polarize and we pick sometimes opposite and then it's, we end up not being able to get along. Yeah. Yeah. And then sometimes we find exactly what we like. And then it's like, there's just no edge. There's no difference. There's no energy to it. So anyway, we're going to end up down a a, a dating uh, hole (laughs) uh, on entrepreneurship. Uh, And I know you were actually, uh, you're you're, uh, in the process of uh, creating something for uh, for the marriage and relationship uh, space as well. If we have time at the end, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. But I, I... you know, as I was preparing for this interview, I wanted to make sure that we gave the audience some of the real, some of the great insights that you have with regards to life and business. And you've been such an inspiration, I know, to so many women. You do a lot of work in this space. You talk to a lot of entrepreneur groups. And the success that you've had is 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 sought after by a lot of people. I was doing the mentoring program with uh, EO for the last two years and, and women, young women entrepreneurs want to hear from successful women entrepreneurs. So if there's a young woman out there, a dental hygienist or, or you know, in an office uh, cube today, what do you tell her? If, if you were mentoring them, what would you tell them? Where do you start? I want you to get a little granular, a little specific on this as well. You know, I think where it really has to start first is um, the only locked door is in your mind. And I'll say that again, the only locked door is in your mind. Um, A lot of people can't get past their fear or I'm going to do that next week. They can't get to that to to set their goals and have massive action towards it. and I think for a lot of women, we're taught, you know, whether you had a, whether you had, you didn't have a parental figure that was, you know, pushing you or you had a parental figure that did everything for you. Sometimes I think sometimes, and, and, and this is my own opinion that, you know, I think dads can sometimes do everything for a little girl and then they, they enable, you know, they, they don't know how to do them for themselves. And when you push your daughter to be independent, you push her to do stuff on her own. I think that's where they build their self-confidence and the confidence levels of women, I think are sometimes not there, but I've, I've had women teach me the most and men teach me the most in that arena. Um, you know, with lots of different experiences I've had working, um, some of the women have torn me down and some of them have built me up. And some of the men have tore me down. Um, Like on Facebook, I had a comment that I should be in the kitchen raising the kids yesterday. (laughs) You know, I was like, well, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I said, and you know what? That's yours. And it's okay that it's yours. (laughs) And and I know you well enough that you are in the kitchen. And you're you're running a company. And you're traveling all over the place and speaking. And you're inspiring thousands, if not millions. I think for women, we, we are, we've got a double edged sword sometimes. And this is just from my experience. And I think men are great. Women tend to take on too much sometimes. And if they don't have a good support system in there and they try to do too much, then they'll fail. And then they'll also emotionally fail. And um, I think for women entrepreneurs that they need to start learning that, you know what, I don't need to do that. I can hire to do that. Or I need to ask for help, ask somebody to fill that gap. And does it matter if you do that part of the work? Like when I was with, um, when I started my business, I got to a point where it's like, okay, I've got to, I want to build this business, but I want to take care of my family. So I started hiring things in as the, as the business grew, I started hiring somebody to help do the laundry, started hiring somebody to help get my groceries. Cause I was still working hygiene three to four days a week. And I was building dental posts. My doctor, the, the dentist I worked for, didn't even know I was building dental posts. He would go home and take a nap 
for an hour and a half every day. And then during lunch, I'm like on the computer and run, you know, returning phone calls. And I get in the car and drive as far as I could go that I'd be able to make it back an hour and a half to see my patients. Nobody knew what was going on. And then it finally got big enough where a couple of dentists were saying things to him. He's like, what have you done? <laughs> so you have to hire things in, you know, I probably didn't learn that fast enough. Yeah. And then sometimes you hire it in and you find out that you thought you had the absolute best employee. And as the team grows, they may have been in the beginning, but as the team grows and expands, your team has to expand as well, not just in numbers, but in what they can do. And I know you've had some difficult times in the past where, you know, you thought someone was just awesome. And then all of a sudden it turns out not only are they neutral, they're a liability. And yeah you've made, had to make the difficult decision in the past to say, look, you're no longer a good fit here and you got to look again. And I think it's, you know, failure is such an interesting thing because everybody wants success. Nobody wants to fail. And I've been talking a lot of this uh, myself uh, in my journey is embrace the failure. You know, it's just part of the, the process. You hire somebody, they're not a good fit, you know, either train them or fire them, do something and then get the right team member there. You know, I was um, going through a divorce, um, a good divorce, best divorce that most people can have. We, we, we work together still. And then he lives eight doors down, but, um, going through that, it was still emotional for me, but I hired in somebody to help me. And I made an, uh, I made a decision under emotional distress. And when you make a decision under emotional distress, you don't think through the whole process. And I did fail there. And then, um, you know, then you have to gracefully get up and move gracefully, move them out. And that's what I did. Um, kindly. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think keeping an employee around that is not a good fit. It, that, that's torture. That, yeah. that, that you're not doing yourself any favors. You're not doing the rest of the team any favors and you're not doing that person any favors. So I always say you got two choices, train and get that, that person to where they need to be or find a way to transition them to something else. And my whole um, culture changed when that person left. That person yeah. was more of a poison to my um, environment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to happen again, right? You know, once we think we have a, we have a perfect team, we grow, the organization grows. Or they go through stuff. Yeah. You could have an amazing employee that's going through a divorce or starts to acquire uh, some sort of an addiction. I mean, think people change. Okay. So you've got to continue, continue, to evaluate, uh, continue to evaluate it. I want to talk about the website for just a minute. You know, I love the fact that, you know, you, you started out, you, you built a, a website uh, in the beginning. You probably spent about 500 bucks to get it off the ground. Um, mm -hmm. But it's always about innovation and always getting better. Extremely successful business, very profitable. And you can say, you know what? It's time to invest and completely redo our website. Yeah. Huge decision. <laughs> yeah. For those that are just listening to this on audio, Tanya took what looked like a knife and stabbed it into her chest. <laughs> um, you probably spent more on the website than most people do in revenue in a year. Uh, yeah but it was a big commitment. It took longer than you thought. You wanted to kill everyone in the process, but you have a, a beautiful personality that you don't stop. You just keep going. No matter what comes at you, you just get back up and you just keep going. What are some of the lessons, and not so much about just designing a, a website and, and executing it, but what are some of the generic lessons in doing a big, bold move like that, that if we set the clock back two years, and he said, okay, now I, I see what's going to happen. I'm going to do it a little differently this time. What are some of the things that you would do? First of all, I was scared to death to rewrite the whole thing because I was afraid it would not work. And everybody's like, well, yeah, it might work. <laughs> so, <laughs> like With all these people on here, it's like, oh, my God, it's got to work. You've got to come up with a plan. Um, I think we did a good amount of planning, but we – I think felt our way through it some, and I'm not sure if you can, I mean, I guess you can over plan. Um, I, I, there might've been a little bit more uh, clarity on maybe how to do things because we kind of felt our way through some of it. Um, 
parts of it. And then we would just, if we, you know, we'd hit a hurdle and then we would just clear it. You know, we found a way around things. Um, we found solutions. Um, I have a great team that will look for solutions. And I think that was part of our success there. And I would push everybody going, okay, deadline. When, when, when is this done? You know, was, deadlines are crucial when you're, you know, when you're on a project. Um, I probably would have had more deadlines. My bad hire that I made with, was scared of deadlines. She was scared of um, not being right. And her need for control um, impaired her um, where she, I, we have a transparent um, culture and there was no transparency in communication when we were developing the website. And once we cleared, cleared that person out, um, everything opened up and we started moving faster. Yeah. Interesting. A uh, bold move, bold, bold move. I mean, things are rocking and rolling and you're like, all right, I'm just going to make this better. And, and you're absolutely right. The, the deadlines keeping, keeping them, uh, multiple deadlines and just keeping them on track. And it's, it's interesting because one of the things that I think that worked in your favor, and I see this in your personality, is you were really clear on what the vision was. You knew what the destination was. You knew what you wanted to accomplish. The coding and the process and, and all the different things that were going to go into it, it's like, I, I don't know how that's all going to work out. I've got a team. I've got the right people. But you always knew where you were headed. And I think that from looking at it from the outside and, and seeing, I remember you going through the process is it didn't matter because you knew exactly what that destination was. Yeah. Um, again, you know, I'm not the detail person, so I know I can, I, I'll paint the picture for everybody. I'm like, okay, how do we get there? <laughs> so, but the things I would have done different is I would have recognized um, some, you know, some bad choices I made dear, under distress. Yeah. The main things I think slowed me down. And you know, one of the things I think about bad hires is the worst thing about the bad hire is there's nobody to blame except for yourself. Yeah. We're the ones who made the hire in the first place, right? So basically what we're saying is I screwed up. Yeah. You know, I, I, this was my decision. I hired the wrong person. Now I'm basically calling myself a bad decision maker. Yeah. And I think it's really difficult as entrepreneurs and as leaders yeah. Uh, to wrap our hands around that. I, I've always struggled. Plus there's, you know, who likes to fire people? Nobody. Yeah. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm too much of a lover. I, I, I like people and I'm a fixer too. It's like, you know, I know I can, I've got the tools, I've got the strategies. I can help this person succeed. I'm going to show the rest of the world that I can make this work. And then about six months after, you know, of banging my head up against the wall, I'm just saying, all right, I don't, I don't know what to do. All right, so decide, unlock that, that uh, door in your mind, take massive action, uh, get a support system around you. What's the next step? Next step? Um, you need a good team around you. You need people yeah. that are going to see your vision and believe in where you're going. Um, I don't think anybody will believe what – where you're going if you don't believe it. And um, that's the purpose behind it. And my purpose, I have three whys. So, um, you know, my first core value is to improve people's lives. And that goes back to a childhood, you know, my mom, um, she had OCD really bad. And to the point where she would wash us and throw things away. And as a child, I just wanted her to be okay in her head. I wanted her to be out of her prison. And, um, she, uh, you know, it, she taught me the most of anybody, um, what I didn't want to be and how to get around things and how to solve problems. Um, and ask why is this person doing what this person's doing? So I just wanted everybody to be okay. I went into healthcare, um, as a hygienist and I like taking care of people. And I was a good hygienist because my mom was, you know, had OCD and I became a hygienist. So something good came out of it. <laughs> um, I was a very clean child. Um, but, you know, that, and I knocked my teeth out when I was eight years old. And the dental team was so good to me when I was in that fear mode of, you know, hitting that, I was on a bicycle and I came down this hill and I hit, hit a 
park car in an apartment area where I was visiting a friend on a summer night and everybody was home and um, I hit the parked car accident. Well, it did on accident. I mean, on purpose because the big dumpster was so big and looked harder. I had, to, I couldn't stop. The brakes had came off, the chain had come off the bike and I had no brakes. So I knocked out my front tooth. I hit my face, um, I had stitches in my chin and my knee and I was all, they felt, I knocked me out and number eight out. Went to the hospital without it. They brought me to the hospital and put the tooth back in. I kept it for 18 years and it made me a great hygienist as well because I know how it feels to have work done on you. I know what the patient's thinking. I understand the fear. And, you know, that was where some of my lies came from. My mother, you know, being trapped in her head and wanting her to be okay. And then the dental team being so good to me. That's how I ended up head first into dentistry. And that's why we have dental posts today. That's why you didn't post. Right. You know, it, it's, it's fascinating because I hear it all the time that so often, you know, we become who we become not because of the, the things that we're, we're trying to gravitate towards, but in many cases, it's, it's, it's what, what we, at the time, we think it's a horrible situation. And we think that it, it, there's no, it doesn't serve us. But I think everything serves us. And, you know, there's two great examples that you would not be who you are today. Dental Post would not be here today had it not been for those two uh, situations. And um, I, I'm, I'm always thankful uh, for regardless of what happens. I, I, I believe life happens for me, not to me. Uh, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but at least it serves me. And I can always find something in every situation that uh, that serves me. And and looking back a couple of years later, it's usually, you know, we think it's the worst thing. We've both been through divorce, not a fun situation. Um, but could you imagine what life would be like today had that not occurred? Um, no. Yeah, we, we would not have the lives we have today. Yeah. And you got to understand why you pick a person that you marry. I mean, it goes back to your childhood. A lot of people don't realize that the way all your pains or the things that bother you go back to when you were a child <laughs> and yeah. you don't realize that till later in life. If you start to identify that you can actually heal yourself and you can be a better person to your friends, to your spouse, to everybody around you, be a better boss. And a lot of times those wounds serve us. You know, yeah, they, the number yeah. of, of clients that I have that, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to lose everything. Well, you know, you're doing $50 million in sales. You're putting 10 million of the bottom line. What, and you're in an industry that is bulletproof. It's like, you know, why are you concerned that you're going to, because that's the way that, because that's, that's where I was brought up. That's the way I believe. Yeah. And they're just constantly, constantly running, trying to figure out how not to lose everything. Yeah. Um, I think everything can serve. Yeah. Just, Limiting beliefs. Yeah. Just, exactly. BS, right? Beliefs. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So final word to the young dental hygienist out there that's thinking about creating her first uh, company. She's doing a little side hustle. She's taking massive action. She's got her support system around her. She understands her why. What are some of the things that she should look for, some of the things that she ought to gravitate towards? What's the secret sauce of your success? To gravitate towards? I, you know what I did was I went after people that were successful and I wanted to ask them how they did th certain things. Um, I believe that what is the, what's the old saying Thor? you put yourself around the top, how many people? Yeah, five so, people. You're constantly becoming the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Yes. So yes. I do believe that. And I don't, I don't know where I got that as a young age, but I always would look at somebody that I admired and see what, how they did something. And I'd go ask them, I'm like, how did you get where you are? And then you, I started learning. It was, um, just, I can't say it, preservation and, you know, just grit, you know, yeah. they just didn't give up. They set their, you know, a lot of people will start a diet and they just give up, you know, it's like those people don't give up no matter what, what they set as a goal. They don't give up. And I always say, all you have to do is walk through the door. Yeah. You know, it's in your mind. You know, if you got, if you got it in your mind, all you got to do is walk through that door and go do it. Absolutely. I mean, this episode is going to probably be episode number 650 or 648. Uh, three years ago, it started with one. 
you know, I had no idea where this show was going to go, but it's something, and my team asked me all the time, it says, you know, we're not monetizing the show, you know, are we going to continue it? And it's kind of, I look at them, I'm like, what do you mean, are we going to continue it? Oh, that, that's not even a question. We just spent three years building something. We have done more in podcasting than 99.999% uh, of the population does. They, they start something and they quit. They start something and they quit. Key to success, like you said, walk to the door and keep walking. When you get knocked over the head with a log and you're passed out, pick yourself up and just keep walking. It doesn't even matter what direction you're walking in as long as you're making progress. People ask that all the time. I don't know if I'm, this is the right decision. I don't know if this is the right thing to do. Choose one because standing where you are ain't going to get you nowhere. Yeah, there's another, um, another uh, quote that I like. It's a, uh, what is it called? Um, when there is no enemy within, then things can do no harm. When there is no enemy, I think it's when there's no enemy within, things can do no harm. Nice. It's like, you know, when you've, when there's no enemy within yourself, nobody can harm you. Yeah. And don't we do a job on ourselves? We do. We really do. <laughs> really do. Um, Someone said, I, I thought this was really cool. Treat yourself like someone you love. Yeah. Treat yourself like someone you love. So you know how you treat people that you love. You care for them. You take care of them. You, you speak kind of them. You, you, you'll do anything. But yet for ourselves, sometimes we treat ourselves like someone we don't even like. Treat yourself like you're somebody you love. Somebody had that on their mirror as well in, in their bathroom. Okay. I'm going to treat myself like somebody I love. I thought that was great. I like that. I do, I do too. Well, Tanya, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. What, what's next? What are you going to be doing with Dental Post? Oh, I'm, I'm building an ecosystem right now with it. Um, I've built an educational platform. Um, I've got an app for that. Um, and I, you know, everybody in dentistry needs continuing ed to keep their license. A lot of them do. So I've, I've built that. I'm adding educational classes onto that. And then I'm building a third piece. It's a secret. I can't tell you. Okay. Um, and, then, and then I have a new business that I've done wireframes for right now that will help people with the divorce business. Um, that will make it a little bit better for everyone. And it's more of a compassionate tight business for divorce. So, well, you've certainly done that extremely well. Your, your ex still works for you, lives eight doors down, um, an amazing relation. I mean, that, that's just beautiful. I mean, that's the way it should be done. And uh, I, I never understood how someone could be married. They, they were in love at some point, I'm hoping. At least that's why they said yeah. yes. It, it, you know, unless somebody was trying to marry somebody else for their money. Uh, you, you loved each other at some point. If it didn't work out, remain friends. Be, yeah. be nice yeah. to each other. I That's mean, especially if kids are involved. Yeah. You know, you're still their parents till death do you part. So that, yeah. that, uh, that, that we need that. I had someone on the show recently that did um, divorce med uh, mediation, not mitigation, mediation. And um, talking about, you know, what's, what's causing it and we all seem to agree that it was one thing and that's communication. The communication yeah. stops, the intimacy stops, you grow apart, and then from there it, it's difficult to, to get back. So whatever you can do to help uh, divorcing couples because they continue to divorce. I figured out uh, in our, uh, our clients, 70% uh, have gone through a divorce. It's like, I don't know if I'm the divorce guy or what, but, uh, or entrepreneurs just have a higher rate of divorce. But something, uh, we, we certainly need some help there. Whatever we can do to, uh, to make that process easier and uh, hopefully avoid, avoid it in some cases as well. Yeah, well, there's a mess there. It needs to be cleaned up because uh, there's a lot of uh, pitting against each other and it shouldn't be that way in, well, our, in our judicial system. If uh, history is any indicator, you will be extremely successful in this venture as well. Thank you. Thank you. Have an amazing day, and uh, you can check out all Tanya's uh, social media uh, handles and contact information in the show notes, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you.